welcome to The Truth About Cancer, A Global Quest. I'm your host, Ty Bollinger. Now, many of you may have seen the Quest for the Cures last year. We were able to travel across the United States interviewing doctors, scientists, researchers, and cancer patients to learn what they were doing to treat cancer. It's only because of your support that we have been able this year to travel across the globe and to do over 100 new interviews with top scientists, researchers, doctors, and cancer patients that are preventing, treating, and beating cancer. What you just saw represents less than half of the total interviews that you will see over the next nine days. Why set out on a quest across the globe in search of the true cures to cancer? You may ask, why would I be so set on finding cancer's true preventions and treatments? Did you know that almost 50% of the people alive today will face cancer? Did you know that one in four males alive today will die from cancer and one in five females will die from cancer? While these statistics give enough reason for many good people to search out the answers, they are not the central reason that triggered my journey across the globe in search of the true answers for cancer. Let me tell you why I had to embark on this journey. For me, everything began with an irreplaceable loss. It's an old wound beginning 20 years ago, but sometimes it still feels like it just happened yesterday. I lost both my mother and my father to cancer. Well, in all actuality, it was actually to cancer's false treatments. I also lost five other close family members to cancer and its so-called treatments. After my folks died, I was angry and paralyzed by grief. I couldn't see any good coming out of what had happened to them and I felt like their lives were wasted and Charlene, my wife, and our children were robbed of precious future memories. But it was in the moment that the first book I wrote about cancer's treatments got into the hands of someone seeking the life-saving information on cancer that everything changed. I then realized for the first time that my parents' life and deaths actually mattered. Just last year, everything we learned culminated in the quest for the cures. Fast forward to the truth about cancer, a global quest. I knew that this endeavor would take more energy, research time, and more tears than anything Charlene and I had ever done before. Again, it was difficult to leave my precious wife and children, and at times I questioned whether it was worth the sacrifice to take this quest around the globe, but Charlene was the first one to tell me that I had to go. I truly owe this entire mission to my precious wife. She was my hope when I'd given up. She was my faith when I was barely holding on, and she was a gift from heaven, and she still is. Oh, and a word about my children. A rule that I learned as a father, never leave your kids out. Our eldest, Brianna, is a diligent worker and adventurous. She loves her animals, the outdoors, and brandishing her pocket knife skills. Bryce has a hysterical sense of humor, a high set of values, respects his elders, and he loves sports like basketball. Then there's Tabitha with her comical laughter, her gentle care for her little sister, and her love for animals and dressing up like a princess. And finally, our youngest, Charity, who loves nothing more than clinging to mommy and daddy and playing with her big sissy, Tabitha. Having these precious children and a wonderful wife has taught me that life is worth fighting for. So it was time for me to embark on this journey, venturing into the areas of the world with more equipment than we can handle, with a chance of getting stopped by authorities, which actually happened more than once, having equipment failure or challenges to health or safety for the team and myself. 
But the bigger personal challenge for me was knowing each day that I would be revisiting the loss of my mother and father and the things that I could have done if I had known about them earlier that would have saved their lives. And yet it is this pain that pushes me further. Dad's my hero. He would be proud of what we're doing. Of that I'm sure. You are about to learn the best treatments and preventions to cancer, protocols that won't harm your body from the world leading doctors across the globe. You'll see and experience things you wouldn't have even believed had you not watched each of these nine episodes and seen the science and documented evidence to support the countless people that are living witnesses that there are true answers to the dreaded disease of cancer. Get ready for one of the most transformational experiences of your life as we journey into a nine-day quest to find the true answers for cancer. This is the truth about cancer, a global quest. We travel the entire globe to gather this life-saving information so that we can empower you with knowledge. Please tell your friends and family to tune in for the next nine days. This information is of vital importance. Dr. Ivars Calvins, one of the 2015 finalists for the European Medicine Award, explains why. It is calculated that uh, the new generation, the generation of today, uh, from this generation each uh, second man and each third woman will have this illness. Cancer. One in two men and one in three women that are alive today are going to face cancer. That's why we at The Truth About Cancer are so passionate about our mission to educate, expose, and eradicate cancer once and for all. In order for us to educate, we felt that it was vitally important that we obtain the most cutting edge information about cancer prevention and treatments, and that's why we traveled across the globe and we obtained interviews with over 100 new experts representing over 20 different countries. A big portion of educating people about the truth is exposing the lies. And that's why, specifically in this episode one, we are going to be exposing the lies about the history of modern medicine and the history of cancer treatments. So after the next nine days of educating you about the truth and exposing the lies, together we will be one step closer to eradicating cancer once and for all. But let me ask you a question. Can someone educate someone else about something that they know nothing about? They gave us a whole hour on nutritionals. A whole hour in, a whole four, hour. in four years of medical school. Mm -hmm. And they told us there's vitamin A and B1 and B2 and C and D and they're in alphabetical order and you can look them up. And then they told us some really basic facts. We got a whole hour. First of all, how much training did you receive on nutrition when you were in medical school? Because I know here in the States, it's almost none. Yeah, not much. Not much, not much. even in Argentina? It's close to, to yeah. Yeah, very little. Close to none? Very little. Because you know, in medical school, they don't teach you, they don't teach you anything about nutrition. It's so vitally important for us to understand this history if we we're going to answer that question, why is modern medicine so drug intensive? And it's not because patent petrochemical medicine is superior. It's because of monopoly medicine, which was created over 100 years ago. The word doctor actually means teacher, and so doctors should be educating their patients and teaching their patients. But unfortunately, the only thing that doctors are taught while they're in medical school it's how to prescribe drugs. We got hours and hours and hours on how to use basically patent medicines, which as you know, are what usually goes on the prescription pad is a molecule that can be patented, which means it's not found in nature, because you can't patent it if it's not found in nature, if it's found in nature, and that's what we get educated in. They don't get paid to educate people, they get paid to write prescriptions. And, and, and you know, you can imagine the drug lobby made sure that's the case. The doctor is brainwashed when he gets out of medical school because the medical school has too much subsidization of the professors who are being paid by the drug company. So the professor never teaches any student in medical school, why don't you try vitamin C? They're going to tell them the latest drug. And that's by design, specifically. You know, there, about over a century ago, there's foundations, the Carnegie and the Rockefeller Foundations, who sort of engineer the curriculum through their uh, grants and donations. Are you wondering what Dr. McCullough meant when he mentioned that the Carnegie's and the Rockefeller Foundations engineered medical school curriculum over a century ago? He was referring to the Flexner Report of 1910, which we covered in our last documentary. Just in case you missed that important piece of this foundation that we're laying today, here's a brief recap. You see, if we're gonna change where we're going, we need to know where we've been. And that's why history is so important. Because as the old saying goes, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. So I don't need to go any further. You can understand when the money is coming from a source which uh, has a vested interest in the outcome, now what's going to happen is the outcome is going to be what the donor wants it to be generally. So this is the problem. And that goes back even further in time uh, to the uh, turn of the last century. 
um, when the um, Rockefeller group and the Carnegie group uh, actually came together and they decided that they would uh, reform uh, medical education in America. At the time of the, you know, the, the late 1800s, and early 1900s, 20th century, medical schools taught a lot of different things. There were homeopathic medical schools, there were naturopathic schools, there were eclectic herbal type medicine schools, and so it, it was all there. There was not one way. And what happened was that the Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundations were interested in establishing the one way. Uh, how would they do that? Well, they would get a hold of the education system and create a, a, a medical monopoly via basically eliminating all competition to patent petrochemical medical education. That's the Flexner Report of 1910, it became known. Abraham and Simon Flexner, you know, were hired to do this. It was a preordained commissioned report. Not surprisingly, the basis of the report was that it was far too easy to start a medical school and that most schools were not teaching sound medicine. Let me translate this for you. These natural health colleges were not pushing enough chemical drugs manufactured by who? Carnegie and Rockefeller. The AMA, who were evaluating the various medical colleges, made it their job to target and shut down the larger respected homeopathic colleges. Carnegie and Rockefeller began to immediately shower hundreds of millions of dollars on these medical schools that were teaching drug intensive medicine. Oh, by the way, when they donated the money, the donors would say, well, um, now we've given you a lot of money and we, we know you're going to do the right thing with it, but would you object if, um, if we had someone from our staff appointed to your board of directors, mm. just to make sure that our, just to see how our money is being spent, you know. Well, that was really a condition of getting the money, so you know the university said, well, that would be fine. You, I, anybody that you would suggest would be, I'm sure, more than adequate. So they began to load up the boards of directors of these uh, teaching centers with people who literally were on the payroll of uh, the donors. So once that was in place, uh, the curriculum of the universities, the teaching centers, swung completely in the direction of pharmaceutical drugs, and it has remained that way ever since. Predictably, those schools that had the financing churned out the better doctors. Oh, wait a minute. Or should I say, the more recognized doctors. In return for the financing, the schools were required to continue teaching course material that was exclusively drug-oriented, with no emphasis on natural medicine. By 1925, over 10,000 herbalists were out of business. By 1940, over 1,500 chiropractors would be prosecuted for practicing quackery. The 22 homeopathic medical schools that flourished in the 1900s dwindled down to just two by 1923. By 1950, all the schools teaching homeopathy were closed. In the end, if a physician did not graduate from a Flexner approved medical school and receive an MD degree, then he or she could not find a job anywhere. This is why today MDs are so heavily biased towards synthetic drug therapy and know little about nutrition, if anything. Now this whole medical field has been skewed in the direction of pharmaceutical drugs which are, can be patented and produce great profits for the uh, producers. And then the next step is that means that the anything coming from nature is excluded. Mm -hmm. And that's where we think, some of us think, that most of the promise lies in these, these very uh, complex substances found in herbs and plants and trees and things like that, mm -hmm. seeds. Um, we, some of us feel that it was probably meant to be that way, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you come out of the, all of this analysis and all of this history with the realization that the medical profession is really like a lap dog of the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. And most of the doctors have no idea that that's the case. They, mm -hmm. they don't understand this history. It's so vitally important for us to understand this history if we're going to answer that question, why is modern medicine so drug intensive? And it's not because patent petrochemical medicine is superior. It's because of monopoly medicine, which was created over 100 years ago. And the other aspect is also a monopoly on uh, treatment. 
only pharmaceutical conventional medicine is uh, the medicine that is uh, officially approved and acclaimed. And people who try to find other solutions are uh, have difficulties when it comes to insurance coverage and other problems. So mm. maintaining monopoly on treatment is also one of the ways to protect and grow this business. And have you noticed that when a new drug comes out and they call it a blockbuster drug, they're not talking about it cures cancer. They're not talking about it's blockbuster for health. They're talking about how many bucks you can make. Mm. And that's what it always is. It seems that the number one goal of a lot of healthcare is to make money. And if we happen to do some good with it, that's fine. But our number one goal is to make money. Very few know that the birth hour of the pharmaceutical industry is actually a deliberate decision by a handful of people on this side and on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean to define disease as a marketplace and build what has now become the largest investment industry upon that simple thought. So cancer is just one element of this uh, unspeakable business of defining diseases as a marketplace. Everything else that you see today around the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the uh, tremendous profits, uh, the inability to eliminate diseases, uh, the propaganda war from that side that they are actually making progress in any disease, all of that comes from the fact that it's a business model, an investment industry that thrives on the continuation of existing diseases and the launching of new diseases. Yes, modern medicine is a business. And just like any business, the goal is to grow this business and also to eliminate competition and to maintain the monopoly. I mean, heck, even in 1913, the American Medical Association developed an internal department that they called the Propaganda Department. And its main goal was to eliminate quacks. But what exactly is quackery? I mean, in the United States, our first president, George Washington, he died as a result of bloodletting, and that was an approved treatment of the day. Ignaz Semmelweis was called a quack because he suggested that doctors actually wash their hands before surgery. And physicians today that do not use chemotherapy, they're considered to be quacks. But very few people know the real history of chemotherapy and its origins. How we first discovered chemotherapy, the first chemotherapy agents in the early 1940s, was because in Italy, when they dropped nitrogen mustard gas, okay, and it was in the, you know, one of these missions and all, and they, they were doing the post-mortem autopsies in the body, the lymphocytes of these patients dropped down. And then some of these doctors got an idea, well, guys, someone has leukemia or lymphoma where these lymphocytes are producing too much. It was suppressed in these people that were dropped with mustard gas. Mm -hmm. So the, the chemotherapy agent comes from the history of actually making mustard gas. You said it. As shocking as this may be, the first chemotherapy agents and even some of the agents that are still used today are derived from the mustard gases that were used to kill soldiers in the world wars. I mean, this explains why many people, including myself, would never touch chemotherapy. It's just too darn toxic. But it's not just me. As you're about to learn, and we learned from a previous interview, 90% of oncologists, they won't do chemo either. There's a study that came out about 90% of physicians, particularly in oncology, would not prescribe the drug that they give to their patients to their wife or their child. Right? So what does that tell us? He's probably not going to do his treatment. Why would you? In 1971, U.S. President Nixon declared a war on cancer, but are we really winning this war in light of the fact that 90% of oncologists won't even take their own treatment? Is the cancer industry any closer today than they were then in finding a cure? Why does this perpetual war on cancer continue? And uh, one of the reasons uh, why this war continues is the money that are being made uh, in this war. And uh, this uh, refers to the treatments, so-called treatments, that are being used in cancer, namely chemotherapy and radiation. Chemotherapy uh, uses the most powerful toxin, toxins known, known to uh, humans. And these toxins, of course, are being sold to us as substances that can uh, kill cancer cells. But uh, 
These substances also kill, annihilate uh, healthy cells in the body, damage its organs, which make uh, the recovery from cancer almost a uh, miracle, <laughs> impossible. And also this, the very substances that are being used to fight cancer are cancer-causing chemicals. So instead of eliminating cancer or curbing cancer, we are inducing, uh, generating new cancers. Mm. Hmm, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? So maybe one of the reasons that 90 plus percent of oncologists won't do conventional treatments like chemotherapy is that they actually cause cancer. Let's listen to Dr. Veronique Desaunier, who actually cured her own mother and herself of breast cancer, talk about tamoxifen which is the most popular drug prescribed to treat breast cancer. Tamoxifen is a drug that most women are put on when they have breast cancer, but they don't tell them that it's classified as a carcinogen by the American Cancer Society and the World Health Organization. So does it make sense to give women a carcinogenic drug that will cause cancers in other parts of her body to prevent cancer? Wow, that's really shocking, isn't it? Tamoxifen, the number one drug prescribed to treat breast cancer, it actually causes cancer. What about other chemotherapy drugs? Is tamoxifen alone? It's estimated by 2020 that more than half of all cancer in America will be medically induced from drugs or radiation. So uh, our medical establishment itself will soon become the leading cause of cancer in America. It's not the cancer that really hurts people, okay? Statistically, 42 to 46% of patients will die, that have cancer will die of cachexia, which is basically wasting of protein. They basically lose all their lean body mass. So that leaves between 58 and 54% of patients that didn't die of cachexia. And the joke, which is only maybe half funny, is that the rest of them die from the treatment. In other words, really nobody dies from the cancer. If you think about it, when a patient gets immunosuppressed and they have cancer, what actually takes them? Liver failure, kidney failure, pneumonia, sepsis, um, but all these things are usually associated with also the person getting chemo and radiation. And then went into practice in San Francisco as an oncologist with a, a group of oncologists. And I began to notice that my long-term survivor list was pretty short. And I began reading the literature that everyone was that uh, after five years of chemo, they, in their own literature, they recorded only a 2.1% survival rate. We know that 97% of people who undergo chemotherapy are dead in five years. That study was placed in the 2004 edition of the Journal of Oncology. It was the cancer doctors telling on themselves. Do I know this study to be true? It was a massive study done by epidemiologists who themselves were doctors. I interviewed the lead of that study just within the last six months. And I said, is this still true today? This was published in 2004. And he says, it's absolutely as true today as it was when we published it back in 2004, and it may be getting worse. When they tell us that chemo's our only chance, it's the first lie you hear. And then you have the surgery. The second lie is we got it all. You can't get it all if you're focused on tumors. You simply can't. Cancer's probably already metastatic. Surgery spills it. Radiation proven not to kill the stem cells, but to enhance them. Well, we always hear, well, cancer came back didn't come back, folks. It just never left. But chemotherapy is not only incredibly ineffective, it's also hazardous material. Let's do chemotherapy, for example. Chemotherapy, yes, it can kill cancer cells. Possibly. It can kill any cell. Here's the issue that I have with chemotherapy. When I see somebody that's handling chemotherapy, making chemotherapy, and they have to wear hazmat suits and gloves and you know, can't touch it because it's toxic, then why are you going to give it to a person who's already sick? I mean, does it make any sense you ask a three-year-old child this question? I would bet you that 90% of the three-year-old children would get it. If that looks dangerous, then I shouldn't touch it. <laughs> That's it. It's almost like sending in napalm because you've got an ant problem. So yes, you'll take care of the ants, possibly, but then you're going to take care of every other form of life, including the grass, and you're going to level the site just to try to get the ants. So the collateral damage are the people that live there in the same house as the ants, meaning that the normal endogenous healthy cells are also going to get massacred. Just from a common sense standpoint, does it make any sense 
to take a therapy, let's use radiation as an example, to take a therapy that we know is dangerous under any circumstance. You break your leg, you break your hand, you go to the hospital, they take you to get an x-ray, they've got the skull and crossbones, they've got the universal triangular radiation sign as a warning. Why is, it, why is there a warning there? You tell me. Because it's known that it's, that it's harmful. And how is it harmful? It damages DNA. It damages DNA. And what is this consequence of damaging that DNA? Potentially cancer. Bingo. So then why would we take something that we know has a very high propensity to create cancer and use that to treat cancer? It does seem insane to treat cancer with chemotherapy and radiation that actually cause cancer, doesn't it? But doctors are required to do this. As a matter of fact, they suffer adverse consequences if they do not prescribe chemo and radiation. They can even lose their license to practice medicine. There was one good doctor who was allowing some natural treatments when parents were asking to introduce them, but he could not offer it himself. And when I asked him what, he said, I couldn't do it, I will lose my job. So it means uh, oncologists here and in many other countries, I, I'm sure they're very restricted in protocols. So they're not free to offer a good treatment. They're very restricted uh, uh, in their protocols. There are many physicians who are truly authentically motivated to want to help people, but yeah. they, there is this pervasive fear that they are going to be discredited and ostracized in their own community. And when they, when they start to embrace some of these alternative philosophies. So that's, that's a strategy that's used to suppress this type of information. When you've got tens of billion dollars of revenue, there is no limit to the clever and sophisticated techniques that you can acquire to manipulate the, the masses. It's against law in California for oncologists to recommend integrative. Is it really? They cannot tell you go do integrative medicine. So unfortunately, um, doctors in America, Australia, the UK, they can risk losing their medical license if they recommend anything other than the gold standard, which is chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Um, in my mind, those treatments are substandard. So we know that chemotherapy and radiotherapy cause cancer, which is the very thing they're supposed to prevent. I mean, you look on the back of a chemo, certain chemotherapy drugs like doxorubicin, and you'll see a listed side effect is leukemia. Mm. And doxorubicin is <laughs> a pretty popular. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And you know, you know as well as I do that the latest research from Harvard Medical School and UCLA is showing that chemotherapy actually stimulates cancer stem cells, which are the germ cells from which new tumors arise. Investigative journalist Laura Bond just mentioned the fact that chemotherapy stimulates cancer stem cells. But what's a stem cell and what does this have to do with cancer? So what, 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 what is a cancer cell and where does it come from? Well, we used to think that any cell could become cancer except for a few limited ones. We thought that if you irritate a cell enough and damage its DNA enough, it'll become immortal and just keep growing. Now we find out, well, that's not true. Only stem cells seem to be the source of cancers. And stem cells are cells that, are, that haven't decided what they want to be yet. They're very primitive cells, so they can be anything, be a heart cell, a brain cell, you know, lung cell. And so these, these uh, stem cells are all through your body, just sitting quietly. Uh, but if you damage the DNA of the stem cell enough through free radicals or whatever, uh, it'll become immortal and then it just keeps producing more and more cells. It wakes up and it's producing lots and lots, thousands, millions, billions of cells, and it becomes a cancer. But it's the stem cell that's pouring it out, kind of like a water hose, it's pouring all these droplets of water out. Uh, the trouble with chemotherapy and conventional treatments is they have no effect on the cancer stem cell. They only kill the daughter cells, the cells that are produced by it. So the tumor will shrink, and they'll claim success, but you haven't killed the stem cell, so it all just comes right back. And what they found is when it comes back, it comes back infinitely more aggressive than it did before. And why would that be? Uh, it, it's kind of complex chemistry, but it has to do with the chemical changes in, the, in what we call the microenvironment of the stem cell. And what you're doing, you're producing a lot of cytokines around those stem cells. These are inflammatory chemicals. Those inflammatory chemicals produce even greater DNA damage so the cancer that comes back is more malignant than the one that started. 
So what they're finding is when you treat patient chemotherapy and radiation and you don't cure them, then you make the cancer infinitely more aggressive and the patients usually die quicker. You have a room full of oncologists listening to the latest drug and they'll say, oh, th this one, we're getting incredible responses with this drug. Well, as I explained, what happens with that incredible response, it causes dramatic shrinkage of the tumor initially because it's just killing the daughter cell. And some are not even non-malignant cell, but it's not affecting the stem cell. Mm. And so then the cancer grows tremendously, but they can say, oh, it, w we get a good response from this, this, this chemotherapeutic. Case. And when they say good response, they mean the tumor shrunk. They mean initially it shrinks the tumor, but they don't say, well, six months later or less, it actually is gonna grow a lot faster. Right. And it's more likely to metastasize. One of the problem with chemo is because when you patient do chemo, those circulating tumor cell, cancer cell that we have, once you have the primary tumor, they can mutate and they become more resistant to other treatments. Sayer, so talk to us today about chemo and radiation resistance. Okay, great. I feel the word itself is almost like a euphemism for something really terrible, which is that when you are exposed to radiation that's based on gamma radiation, it's basically ionizing, it will cause damage to whatever basic tissue it's being exposed to. So in the same way, chemotherapy is also designed to be genotoxic. So you're trying to target fast replicating cells. And so by doing so, it is by definition also carcinogenic. And so really when we talk about resistance to chemo radiation, it's really just um, a way of blaming the victim because we're all, when exposed to conventional chemo and radiation going to be harmed and it is actually going to have a carcinogenic effect and it will often cause secondary cancers. So technically, I think people need to be aware that this isn't truly a cancer therapy. At best, it's palliative in the sense that it might shrink a tumor, but what really the, 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 the main thing I would like to get across is, is that it's going to cause an enrichment of the actual mother cell that's beneath the tumor, which is known as the cancer stem cell. So technically you are shrinking the tumor size, but you're enriching the population of the tumorigenic cells at the very same moment. So again, the idea that some people are resistant to chemo and radiation is really a false concept. Everyone exposed to radiation and chemo will have secondary adverse effects, some of which are worse than the original condition they're being treated for. So stem cells are the key, and chemotherapy and radiation actually enrich stem cells. Now we will get back to this topic a little bit later on, but that last statement from Sayer G really shook me. Everyone will have secondary adverse effects from chemo and radiation. Despite this fact, as we've already learned, many doctors from countries across the globe might even lose their license if they do not prescribe chemo and radiation. Are you beginning to see the way that Big Pharma has its tentacles throughout this medical cartel, especially when it comes to chemotherapy? But that's not all. Chemotherapy also creates side effects that can then be treated with more drugs. Let's listen to Dr. Alexander Nitzwicki elaborate on this issue. Chemotherapy business is also a wonderful example of multiplicator <clears throat> because uh, the side effects that chemotherapy produces is bone marrow transplants. This is the results of chemotherapy, bleeding from the intestines, uh, that requires drug, anti-nausea uh, drugs, and uh, many others, uh, changes in the brain. There is even term for it, it's called chemo brain, because the chemotherapy affects, you know, so many organs in the body, and it's the uh, reason for prescribing more drugs. So chemotherapy multiplies the business, and this is why it lasts f until this day. Mm -hmm. Chemotherapy destroys your army, <laughs> it destroys your immune system. Mm -hmm. Not only that, it causes secondary cancers in the body, it makes existing cancer stem cells more aggressive, and it causes a host of lifelong, potentially lifelong damages to the body, from brain damage to hearing loss to neuropathy with loss of the use of your hands and feet, to kidney and bladder damage, I mean bone damage, heart damage, lung damage. Mm -hmm. It, it's just total collateral damage from chemotherapy. We didn't know 50 or 60 years ago the, uh, the role that the immune system played like we did today because we didn't have the technology to uh, measure it and identify it. But today, uh, a person who's paying attention will see more and more medical articles. They'll see more and more stuff come out on the 
investigative news shows talking about breakthroughs in immunotherapy right. and, and how they are in fact tapping and harnessing the immune system to ferret out cancer and kill it in a very specific manner instead of this global, you know, napalming of the body with right. chemo, chemo and radiation, which, you know, I don't, I don't know that it's ever been successful at any level except to provide more money for, for you know, the administration and, and I guess the folks that are, that are coming up with that. I mean, if the money had been poured into immunotherapy over the last 50 years, right. as it has been these other attempts that ended up failing, I, 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 I'd have to believe that the results would be a whole lot better than, but certainly been a lot less suffering. I think anybody who has met or been close to someone undergoing chemo and radiation will admit that it is a suffering uh, in, instead of a treatment. In order for having a maximum chance of fighting and uh, overcoming cancer, uh, we need an intact immune system. And that too uh, makes the current approach of chemotherapy so unethical. It destroys the chemotherapy, the first organ that is affected, actually the target organ uh, is uh, the bone marrow. The destruction of the generation of defense cells, leukocytes, etc., are built in the, uh, in the bone marrow. So from the very onset, from the very planning uh, of chemotherapy, from the very scientific approach, it is a deception. It is an unethical, deceptive business that uh, creates illusions for millions of people. And everyone, every scientist involved in it, I, I'm not blaming the doctors. They sometimes uh, don't have the education uh, uh, to, to go at that length. But, but every scientist mm -hmm. knows that mm -hmm. it is a huge fraud. And those who say they don't, they should quit the job of being a scientist. Mm -hmm. I appreciate what Dr. Rath just said, that doctors, they're not educated about this. They don't understand that chemotherapy is a huge fraud, but that every scientist that doesn't understand and admit that chemotherapy is a huge fraud, they should quit the job of being a scientist. Now, Dr. Rath and A.J. Lanigan, an immunologist, just both address the same topic, that the immune system is the key to fighting cancer and to health. And one of the interesting things about chemotherapy is that it totally destroys and devastates the immune system. Another unique thing about chemotherapy that many people don't know is that oncologists can actually make kickbacks from prescribing chemotherapy drugs. This is a unique characteristic to the cancer industry that does not apply anywhere else in pharmaceutical drugs.